Hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie, and I'm coming to you tonight from Adobe, just down the street, down on, uh, on Hooper Street here in San Francisco. I am an experienced researcher on our design research and strategy team. I joined in September of 2017. Uh, before that, I came from an augmented reality hardware company based in Los Angeles called Daiquiri that designed all sorts of really interesting head-mounted displays for field service engineers. And then before that, I came from the, well, I'll just say from academia, from uh, perception and cognition literature. So um, with that said, I'll be walking you through how I've gone about conducting design research for emerging technologies and particularly augmented reality using some of my work at Adobe as a case study, if you will. So to start off though, I figured I'd go over what exactly augmented reality actually is. From a show of hands, how many people in this room feel like if I walked up to you right now, I may or may not actually do this, uh, you think you could define what augmented reality is? Show of hands, all right, got, got, got a couple hands. Has anyone here actually created an augmented reality experience? Sure. There is one, there's, there, there are two people, okay, awesome, I'm recruiting you for my next study, not the purpose of my talk. Uh, all right, so, uh, so I'll go through actually um, the, the widely used definition of augmented reality, which goes all the way back to, believe it or not, 1997. This is still a commonly cited uh, definition of augmented reality put forth by Ronald Azima. So there are three characteristics of augmented reality. First, it combines the real and the virtual. It must be interactive real time. And third, it must be registered in 3D. So what exactly does that mean? So that means that the, the digital content must accurately align with the real world in which it is overlaid. And that helps the, uh, the user believe that the real and the virtual content is coherent, creating a seamlessness that makes the whole scene believable. So this looping video that's been going on in the background here is uh, Adobe's Project Arrow, which is our augmented reality authoring application that shows all three of those characteristics of augmented reality being met. I need to start learning how to use this clicker and not walking over to my laptop. Uh. Success, awesome. So you might have also heard about virtual reality, mixed reality, extended reality, other, other acronyms ending in the letter R. So where did that all begin? So this continuum here, the reality virtuality continuum, this goes back to 1994. We're using a lot of stuff from the 90s here. So um, you'll, you'll hear where all of those acronyms kind of fit within this. And some of my work also involves virtual reality, though what I'm focusing on today is augmented reality. I'll start with the real environment, which depending on how much you want to debate the singularity with me later is where we are now, <laughs> real environment. Then we have uh, augmented reality next, which is basically primarily the real world with some digital elements overlaid. As we go farther to the right, which is my left on here, and it's really confusing, uh, you have primarily the uh, virtual world with some real elements overlaid. And then all the way to the right, you have virtual environments or virtual reality. This is where you're fully immersed. Think a headset like Oculus or HTC Vive. You have no elements of the real world around you. And anything between real environment and virtual environment is mixed reality. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of context about the, uh, the space that I'm conducting research and a little bit more about augmented reality versus virtual reality and those other things that end in R. So let me walk you through a case study. Let's set the stage by talking about the AR landscape all the way back to September 2014, not the 90s, uh, when I joined Adobe as an experience researcher. So at this time, if you wanted to create an augmented reality experience similar to the video I just showed you, you pretty much had to know how to code. Or you were using a game engine or collaborated with someone who knew how to use a game engine to create an experience like this. Also, in that same year, Digit Capital released a market research report that stated that by 2021, there would be over a billion users of mobile AR. So that's a massive opportunity that is currently, wait for it, 
bottlenecked by a very, uh, a very specialized skill set. I got so carried away by my own pun, I forgot my sentence. It's awesome. Uh, so enter Project Arrow. So this is our uh, th this augmented reality app that I've been talking about. So the idea behind Project Arrow was that it's a code-free uh, democratization of um, augmented reality authoring. So you would not need to know how to code uh, to create these experiences, and you can... Um, unbottleneck the bottleneck. But when I say creatives, what exactly does that mean? Who are these creative professionals that might be using this tool? So this brings me to the main topic of my talk today, defining target end users, defining target end users in an emerging space like augmented reality. So I'll walk you through all of these steps, starting with taking inventory. So I like this image here because it shows beautifully charted territory down here, our known or mostly known here be dragons, very clear, uncharted territory. Uh, but the most interesting part for me is this line right here that goes between the charted territory and the uncharted territory. How do we define that line? And that line is sometimes pretty darn gray when you get to a, something like augmented reality. So what I like to do is essentially start out with this matrix here of our, uh, our knowns along the top, our unknowns along the bottom. And generally speaking, whenever I figured out these two cells, I have a pretty good idea of when and where I need to start conducting primary or new research, i.e. research that's not going to be on the slide that I'm going to show you next. So taking inventory of existing knowledge and by no means is this some you know, brilliant thing that is only inherent to emerging technology. No, this is just good UX research practice. So ultimately, this is what I'm doing, which is arguably what you're probably doing with technologies that are not augmented reality or virtual reality. I'm starting with internal stakeholder interviews, going to a range of different stakeholders across design, product, engineering, marketing, identifying assumptions, what does everyone want, want to learn? What, what assumptions are we bringing forth about who actually might be using this product or the idea for a product, depending what stage you're at? Next, conducting your, uh, uh, essentially a literature review of past primary research. So chances are this product that you're planning to research didn't come out of nowhere. There's probably a product or idea that preceded it. What research came before? And can you codify that? Uh, conducting past secondary research reviews, so market research, academic literature, there might be some useful information there as well. And then drawing upon any subject matter experts uh, and codifying that knowledge. So in the case of augmented reality, I was one of those subject matter experts as well as many other folks on my team. So in my, uh, my brief intro, I was mentioning that I worked at this augmented reality company before coming to Adobe. Uh, so this, uh, this um, helmet here is called the Daiquiri Smart Helmet, and it's essentially an augmented reality hard hat. So you'd have augmented reality work instructions and 3D models of various heavy industry things that you were uh, learning how to build on, on that visor. So back to the subject matter expertise part, I had an idea of who was creating the content that would appear on that screen, who was creating augmented reality experiences. And these are folks whom I lovingly refer to as unicorns. And these were folks I was working alongside of. These folks were my friends. And I, I had some idea of who they were. They're primarily developers with really strong design abilities. And they had an incredible knack for making things work together, tools work together that arguably should never be able to work together. So now with that, that uh, taking, taking uh, inventory step behind us, I set out to conduct some primary research on who actually needs an AR authoring tool anyway. So this leads us to step two, studying lead user behavior. So what exactly do I mean by this? So a lead user strategy is essentially looking at folks who are on the extreme of a population. In my case, these are individuals who are already creating an augmented reality experience, have experience in this space. The two folks who put their hands up at the beginning of this talk, I would have gone and talked to you about what you were making, uh, what, what your workflows were. Uh, this could also be folks who are power users of, uh, of a product, people who absolutely would never use your product. Basically, you're, you're, you're talking to these people first to, devi to devise um, 
uh, view of your landscape so you can divide, to develop, I keep saying devise, develop a wide range of opportunities. And this can be contrasted with a typical user strategy, which is where you have your target end users much more defined, it's a less ambiguous space, and you can go and target a much more specific problem with your research and what you want to learn. So going back to conducting those lead user interviews, Indeed, these folks that I had observed and worked with before, I wasn't observing them when I was working with them, if that makes sense. Uh, they, they indeed existed in the augmented reality uh, landscape. But what we also found was something a lot more complex than that. You had these um, quote unquote unicorns, but you also had designers, developers, other creative professionals, other stakeholders who were none of these titles. And this was a really interesting set of challenges, collaboration challenges, asset management challenges, other things related to augmented reality challenges. And we formed a much richer picture of what the landscape was like through those lead user interviews. Another interesting finding that emerged from conducting this uh, lead user research were these three attribute ranges. Pretty much if you went through every single interview that we conducted, you could put a single user somewhere on these three axes. So the first axis, of course, augmented reality experience, from none to expert, 3D experience, so experience working with, uh, with 3D tools for, say, modeling, rendering, texturing, these sorts of things. Uh, market focused, so from being installation focused or, or uh, sort of art for art's sake focused, all the way to brand focus, so say working at an agency, primarily working with brands. And last but not least, these interviews also allowed us to categorize context, goals, and output, and get a really great holistic sense of whom it was that we were actually speaking with. And through all of these different points, you can get a great sense of what user needs were. And these can either be met needs or unmet needs. And these unmet needs, that's where really interesting opportunities lie. This is where folks might be motivated to be doing something, but they're using a workaround to accomplish that goal. That's where your product can make a really strong impact. So we've studied these, these lead users. We've conducted some qualitative interviews. Now, the next step that I like to take and took in this case was identifying analogs to that lead user behavior in typical users. And in this case, it is quite literally taking inventory, surveying a, a population of typical users. So by and large, this roughly translates to who needs to see their stuff in space and why. It's not actually what we asked. By and large, yes, but not, you know, I didn't, I swear I write better survey questions than that. Uh, in, in the case of augmented reality, this looks more like how many people are currently making real versions of their digital con content? What does paper prototyping look like? What are the conditions under which people are doing those sorts of activities? And what are the similarities and differences from what we identified in those lead user interviews? With all of this information in hand, so just stepping back, we have a wealth of qualitative information at this point. We have quantitative information at this point. Uh, you can start building some user profiles or personas, basically getting a, getting a portrait of, uh, of who this user is through looking at patterns between convergent data. Picture of patterns. Uh, so usually what I like to include in, uh, in, in these user profiles, going through a day in the life of the user, uh, whom fre their frequent collaborators are, what are their goals or motivations, what are their unmet needs, and what are their tools. And then the uh, next and last step that I'll be talking about is concept research. Note that I very consciously do not say usability research here. And I do that for the reason that this, this concept research can be conducted very, very early in the product development life cycle. You do not need to have a completed bill or an application. And you can get very, very rich insights with just paper and pencil. And this can be very efficient in that if you wait to conduct usability testing once you do have that final build, it can be very costly to make a change. Here you can get some really great in insights, can be very impactful very early on, and again, with just paper and pencil. So in our case, so we, we have a, a general sense of whom our users might be. 
lead users, typical users. Uh, but what might these users might actually want to make an augmented reality? So I definitely want to give credit to this wonderful IDEO article, uh, Applying Human-Centered Design for Emerging Technologies, that inspired this, uh, this concept research that we conducted with users. So we have a scene. So this is a printout of an ordinary street scene. We had a couple more of these uh, different ordinary scenes. We had erasable markers and this acrylic sheet. So we brought in users who generally fit within our, our different uh, user profiles that we had identified from subsequent research. And we asked users, how would you make this ordinary scene extraordinary? And gave users their erasable markers and their acrylic sheet. And they went to town and drew and narrated what they were, what they were thinking of, uh, making this ordinary scene extraordinary. So what did we find? So these, these two images are, they nicely and quickly demonstrate some, some very key differences between what we saw. There are many more patterns that I won't get into for, for this talk, but you can, you can quickly uh, see that on the left here, we have a very pragmatic sort of interior decorating situation going on here. Uh, lots of different colors, lots of, um, of different types of furniture. Whereas on the right, we have something very fantastical. We have this space orb in this empty apartment with, with, with these emitters coming out of it and the, the user described uh, like sounds and animation and this very rich interactive scene. So again, one of the many patterns that we observed here, but you could really start to bucket uh, and see patterns in what folks were drawing according to whom our uh, sort of user profiles were, which was really interesting and gave us a sense of of uh, what these folks wanted to do in augmented reality, what they saw as potential. And I should mention that when, when I said magical lens, that's literally what we called that acrylic sheet. At no point, and I was super militant about this, even with my observers, do not mention augmented reality at any point in this interview until after we are done this part, because we do not want folks to be thinking about some out there technology that might be very threatening or might be very unfamiliar. We really want to keep it to this magical level without any constraints. So, and, and also just drawing this back to the, uh, the spectrum of uh, virtuality, uh, reality we were talking about earlier, uh, digital content, real world, yeah. anyhow. Uh, so in, in summary, uh, we have these five steps that I walked you through. So taking inventory, good best practice arguably for any type of uh, UX research that you're conducting, emerging or not, uh, conducting some lead user interviews, um, then going off to identify some analogs of that lead user behavior and a more typical user population, uh, building your user profiles or personas, and conducting uh, concept research. And just in case anyone is interested, you can sign up for the Project Aero Beta, uh, going down to this link, and then signing up for early access. And I love to nerd out about augmented reality and all of those other things ending in R at any time. So feel free to reach out to me here. And we are also hiring uh, some experienced researchers for a number of different products as well. So feel free to ping me about that too. Thank you so much.